for me, but he did a good job. And I love having a classical composer compose the music for one of the songs that we sing. I don't know if everybody recognized that last one, but that was Beethoven's Ninth, his Ode to Joy. Beautiful piece of music. But putting words to it is even more beautiful. And that's what we have there as well. Uh, I have another folded up blanket. This is called a fleece throw. It's the same as I brought to you last time. It's about 50 inches by 60 inches, so it's not very big. About four feet by uh, five feet is all. Just enough to take a little bit of the edge off sometimes. But what I brought it for is because it's so expensive. Walmart has bins of these for $2 a piece. And for our homeless giveaway, there can't be much better than just getting a whole bunch of these to throw in there. So I wanted to bring that to you for your... I'm, I'm shilling for Walmart now. I guess you've noticed that, right? Okay. Yeah, whatever. All right, this is the Christmas season. We don't like to use that term in the Churches of Christ. And one of the reasons is because we don't do a Mass. We don't do a Christmas Mass. We don't do a special ceremony. We don't do special holidays. You know, the word holiday comes from the word holy day. We think every day is holy. We specially pay attention on what we call the Lord's Day, the Sunday, the day the Lord was resurrected from the dead. But the Christmas time of the season is one which a lot of people celebrate. And for us to ignore it is kind of silly as well. So I've taken these months of uh, these Sundays in December to bring forth some subjects that would help us in this as well. In this particular one, we have what's called the Song of Simeon, Luke chapter 2. You perhaps have read it, you've passed over it, seen it, kind of went on with it and didn't even really spend much time with it. We are going to spend some time with it this morning and next Sunday as well. Because the Song of Simeon is such a beautiful statement of the coming of the Christ. And to some extent it expresses exactly what we've been saying all this time as well. It's not really just the coming of the Christ, not just the birth of Christ, but what he came for. The death of Christ as well. And we're going to see that in Simeon's song. And Simeon asked the question, is this the one? And of course the title of this is, yes, this is the one. Luke chapter 2 verse 22, let's just start right there. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Who is it they brought up? The baby Jesus, right? Verse 23, isn't it, uh, as it is written in the law of Moses, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 12. By the way, what is the first male that opens the womb? Well, that's the firstborn child. And if it's a male child, then it has to be considered holy to the Lord according to the law of Moses. In verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now we're going to come back to that in just a little while. But I want you to notice he just automatically says two turtle doves or two young pigeons. In the law of Moses, it actually didn't say to bring turtle doves. It said to bring a lamb. If you can't afford a lamb, then you bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Verse 25 and 26. There was a man in Jerusalem. His name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Here we have introduced a man. Do we know anything else about him? No. We don't know how old he was, although we presume he was old, because it's going to say something about him in a moment, about you're not going to die until you see the glory of Israel come. We presume he's old. We don't know that he was a priest. It did say he went to the temple, but a lot of people would go to the temple if they were righteous and devout. So it's possible that was just because he went. And it could have been he went to the temple simply because the Lord had told him, you go to the temple so you can see my Christ child come. We don't know, but it says the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not, die, uh, they would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now you and I look at that and we say, man, that's a great blessing, isn't it? When did he tell him? Did he tell him when he was a teenager? And 70 years later, the Lord comes. We don't know. It doesn't say. It just says that he was righteous and devout, and the Holy Spirit told him, you will not die until you see the Christ come. Here comes Mary. Here comes Joseph. And here comes Simeon. 
Uh, he's never seen them before. They've never seen him before. A divinely planned encounter. We sometimes call this serendipitous, right? Like it was accidentally good, but it's not accidental at all, is it? This is a Holy Spirit or divinely planned encounter. And it's about to take place in the temple courts. Verse 27 to 32. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. He came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the law, custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Because my eyes have seen your salvation. That you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. All right, so here they are. The Holy Spirit had said to him, you will not die before you see the Messiah. Day by day, he had prayed. Day by day, he had gone to the temple. Please come, Lord Jesus. Year after year, his prayers were not, were not answered. He grew older. His anticipation grew stronger because he knew he couldn't live forever. Perhaps he's 70 or 80 now. We don't know. Perhaps he had a long gray beard. Perhaps he was stooped at the shoulder. Perhaps he had the wrinkled face and bushy eyebrows of an old man. Perhaps he had the trembling hands of an old man. We don't know. We just know he had been told to go there and wait for the Lord to come. He knew it couldn't be long because he couldn't live forever. And the Lord had to be coming soon. Can you imagine the scene? Every morning early, Simeon goes to the temple. Did they have our regular hours at the temple? Have you thought about it? Did they have a sign posted at the front gate saying, we open up at 6 a.m. or whatever? What? Didn't say that, does it? But he went early to the temple every day. He watched and waited specifically for the Messiah to come. Now here's a question. How would he know him? What should he look for? Did the Lord tell him he was looking for a baby? My goodness, every firstborn male child had to be taken to the temple, wouldn't he? That'd get old fast, wouldn't it? Did he know what to look for? Was it a baby? Was it a teenager or a strong young man? No one knows the answer, do we? If you are curious, you may ask him someday. Although we may not care when we get there, do we? Day by day, he kept watch over the throngs coming into the temple. And each time a young couple came in with a baby, he whispered, is this the one? If he saw a fine looking teenager, he would also say, is this the one Lord or is it someone else? Each day he watched, he looked, and he questioned. Each day the answer came back the same over and over again. No, that's not the one. Keep looking. Keep watching. Keep waiting. Now we know that the Lord has done this with some of his people in the past. He gave Noah a message, for example, to build an ark. He says, I'm going to bring a flood to wash the uh, surface of the earth clean. Noah built that ark in his backyard, essentially. Spent a hundred years preaching to a lost and dying world. And finally, the Lord sent rain. Well, that's a long time to wait, isn't it? How many of you are going to live to 100? <laughs> no, we're not going to do that, are we? He was 500 years old when God came to him in the first place. I don't know whether that was considered an old man or middle age. Whatever it was, it took a while for the Lord to fulfill it. Simeon is having to wait, isn't he? Now, that's great faith on his part to wait. Keep going to the temple. But now things change. He doesn't tell him to wait anymore. Here comes Mary holding the baby Jesus in her arms with Joseph by her side. How old is Jesus at this point? He's 40 days old. How do we know that? Because that's when they were supposed to bring the child to the temple to be given sacrifice and offering for and to dedicate him to the Lord. He's 40 days old. He's still a baby, isn't he? <coughs> Never was there a more unlikely couple, though, He's a poor carpenter. She's a peasant girl. 
Uh, this baby that is born to them is not born from a family that one would look to to say this is obviously where the king is coming from. They're obviously from the country. They obviously don't have much money. How do I know that? Remember I told you about the two turtle doves and the pigeons earlier? If they had money, they'd bring a sheep or a lamb. If they brought turtle doves or pigeons, that showed they didn't have money. Now, to you carpenters out there, I'm sorry, but this is a carpenter that didn't make a lot of money. Now, I don't know why. Maybe he wasn't very good at business, although I suspect that's not true. It was just that he didn't have a lot of extra money. He didn't have the kind of money that would allow him to afford a lamb. So he brought turtle doves or pigeons to make offering to the Lord. Now, if you were people watching, would these be the kind of people you'd look to to actually choose and say, this is the one who's supposed to have the Messiah? No. Sorry about that. I messed up on this particular slide. You'd have to read it blue on blue. Uh, they weren't educated. They weren't part of the... Uh, academic elite. They weren't part of the uh, upper crust. If anything, they were part of the working lower class, weren't they? They're not where we would expect the Lord to send his son, his Messiah, to come. That's where he chose. When Simeon sees them, he asks the same question he'd asked for maybe 10,000 times before. We don't know how long it was. Is this the one? Holy Spirit says what? Very simply, yes. I don't know what Simeon felt. Do you? We can imagine. Simeon leads, his heart leaps within him, the scripture actually says. And the days of waiting are over. The Lord Christ is before him. Here is the one for whom the nation has been waiting. Simeon is exhilarated. Now this description basically says he kind of casually walks over to them and introduces himself. He says, may I hold your baby? I don't think that's what happened at all. I really don't. I think he jumped and leapt and, and screamed, may I hold your, no, maybe he didn't do that, I don't know. But she let him hold her baby. Gave, her the, uh, gave Simeon the infant. And the thought hits him and says, I'm holding the salvation of the world in my arms. He, above all people, would have understood this, wouldn't he? It's fascinating to notice what Mary does whenever she has something like this happen. Scripture just records that she kept it in her heart. She put it in a treasured place in her heart to remember, but doesn't do anything about it otherwise. Because what could she do? She had already had the child. She was the mother of the Son of God. She couldn't do anything but just treasure it in her heart until he had to, his ministry to fulfill. At that point, Simeon breaks out in a song of praise. Now, I love this because in the Old Testament you find this periodically. Songs that are fully formed, fully expressed. And by the way, when you say a song, when they sang, they more than likely spoke it. They didn't have music written for it at that time. Can you imagine an Elvis Presley all of a sudden breaking out in song? I don't think that's quite what it was, but he had words in his heart, and that's what songs really are, aren't they? He breaks out into song of praise, a song that is so beautiful that it's come down to us through the centuries as a climactic song of what many today call Christmas time. The song is called the Nunc Dimittis. You know why it's called that? Because Latin ruled the religious world for a long time under Catholic ruled uh, Western Europe. And in Latin, the beginning words of that song are nunc dimittis, and I forgot to look it up. I apologize to you. Uh, but that is a Jeopardy question answer if you ever need it someday. What follows is first the song, verse 29 through 32. Then there's a personal word of prophecy, blessing for Mary, verse 34 and 35. And it goes something like this. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant in peace. How do we know that Simeon was old? This phrase tells us there's nothing else, doesn't it? He was ready to go home now. He was ready to be dismissed. Why? Because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. 
Simeon's first thought is that he is now ready to die. The word dismiss is a military word. It's used to describe a sentinel who has stood watch during the long hours of the night. And he goes to his, uh, now as the sun comes up, he goes to his master, his officer in charge. But he knows his work is done, and he goes to his commanding officer to be dismissed. Once dismissed, he goes back to his barracks to sleep. In Simeon's case, going back to his barracks to sleep, though, would be, I'm being dismissed by the Lord now. I'm going home. I'm going for my eternal rest. That's the way Simeon feels, though. He's been on watch. The long wait is over. The years of anticipation have been fulfilled. The sentry duty is finished. He has seen and personally held the Lord's Christ. Now, the word Christ is the Greek word. And so in the New Testament, we have the word Christ. In the Old Testament, it would have been in Hebrew or Aramaic, mostly in Hebrew. And the word is Messiah. He has held the Lord's Messiah. Doctors see it happening all the time. People who have held on just until the goal is reached. Uh, life is complete, whatever it may have been. And they finally give up and, and die. Perhaps that's what's happening with Simeon at this point. Although the scriptures don't tell us that he died. Remember that. But that's how he feels. He won't live to see the Lord grow up. This is important. He won't witness any of the great miracles. He won't see Jesus walk on water. In fact, most of them didn't see that, did they? But his disciples saw it. He won't see him feed the 5,000 or raise the dead. But he did those things. And Simeon saw that. But he'll be long gone before they actually have those things happen. He'll be gone before Jesus stands before Pilate. He'll be gone before the crucifixion. He'll be gone before the resurrection. But it doesn't matter. Why? He doesn't need to see the end because he saw the beginning. And that's all that mattered. I think Simeon's a beautiful expression of faith in God. In the words that follow, Simeon tells us three important things about who Jesus is. One, he is the glory of Israel. We're going to come back to that in a moment. He is the savior of the world. And this one's a little strange. He is the divider of the human race. We'll see this as we go into it more. But we won't get to this one until next week. Because he brings division. He brings conflict. Remember Jesus when he tells his disciples, you think I came to bring peace? No, I came with a sword. And he did, didn't he? It was going to be difficult. But Simeon says all this from the very beginning. How about this glory of Israel? Let's take just a few moments to go through that. In verse 32, Simeon calls him the glory of Israel. In this baby, Simeon sees the fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people across the centuries. Remember the time of Abraham when the Lord said, I will make your name great and make of you a great nation. And through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That was a promise Simeon saw fulfilled in the coming of the Christ. Remember the re, uh, reaffirmation to Isaac. The uh, reaffirmation to Jacob. Still later, God told Moses that one day a great prophet would come who would be unlike any other prophet before him. Still later, God promised David a son who would reign on the throne forever. And still later, God, through Isaiah, spoke, promised that a son would be born of a virgin, and that his name would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, we see these prophecies, we see them coming over and over again, but even later he gives more. Micah predicted that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Why do we sing about the little town of Bethlehem? Because that's where he was born. It was passed down from father to son, mother to daughter, family to family. From older to younger, Jewish children everywhere were taught 
to pray for the Messiah's appearance. By the time you get to the first century, you have all these centuries of expectation built up. However, some thought that the Messiah wasn't coming. They thought if he did come, he would be a political leader. Overthrow Rome and restore Israel to its rightful place in the world as the ruling nation. Some thought the Messiah would be God himself. Those were closer to the truth than what they possibly knew. The others expected a second Moses or Elijah. By the time Christ was born, the question above all others was this one right here. Why is it taking so long? Why has the Lord delayed the coming of the Messiah? We're told in Galatians that in the fullness of time, that fullness is actually a term that's used of a pregnant woman. When the time comes, then the baby is born. And in the coming of the Messiah, when the time comes, God would bring forth a son. And he does. Now after all these years, all God's promises are coming true in the form of this little baby. And that's what Simeon means when he calls Jesus the glory of Israel. But he's also the savior of the world. A light of revelation for the Gentiles. Boy, that did not set well with some of them, I'm sure. I'm sure people in the temple were saying, what are you using that term for in the temple of all things? We don't talk about Gentiles in here. We are polite people. We don't use that kind of language, right? No, he says this child, the savior of the world, came to be a light of revelation for the Gentiles as well. You won't find this in the other songs of Christmas, the other passages. Mary's song is completely Jewish. It's recorded in Matthew, I believe. Uh, she thinks in Jewish terms and expresses the thoughts of Jewish ideas. The Gentiles are nowhere in view. But in Luke they are. The same is true of Zechariah. Remember Zechariah had a song also. The angel's song broadens the viewpoint a little bit by talking about peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's goodwill toward all men, but nowhere in any of the previous songs are the Gentiles mentioned by name until we come to Simeon's song. But Simeon explicitly says that the baby will not only be the glory of his own people, Israel, he'll also be the light of revelation for the Gentiles. He's not just for Israel. He didn't come just for their benefit. He came to shine a light of the revelation of God in every nation, every tribe, every kindred, and every tongue. The Jews couldn't say, he belongs to us and you can't have him. Nor could they say, you have to become a Jew in order to enjoy the Messiah's benefits. They can't say that. He is the savior of the world. A light of revelation for the Gentiles. Western Europe was white, Western Europe basically. When they first went on their missionary journeys, which they did very soon after exploring the New World, they sent out their missionaries to make Christians. They went to West Africa. And I don't know if you're familiar with the various skin tones of Africa. All of them are dark. Some of them are outright black. Some of them are so black they're blue. West Africa was very dark colored Africa. <laughs> These white Europeans came down in their wool suits, which of course in cold northern Europe you wore wool suits. Here they were coming to equatorial Africa, wanting to preach a gospel to a people they weren't even sure were people at one time. And they made little European enclaves for them to come to the gospel in. They put up schools and hospitals. They'd make the children wear shoes. What in the world did you want? My, grand, my dad came from Oklahoma, southern Oklahoma. He said, nobody wanted shoes. What do I want shoes for? They got in the way. Well, I'm sure Africans thought the same thing. But they'd put them into shirts and skirts, and they'd make them dress up like little Europeans. And they said, that's making them Christian. They missed the point, didn't they? He's the savior of the whole world. Not to make them like little Europeans, but to make them like Christ. Which, by the way, Christ was not a white man. Did you go? 
I know I, I shouldn't be saying things like this without warning you ahead of time. That can be shocking to some, I know, but it's true. He wasn't a white man. We, our pictures say so, but no. He wasn't a rich man either, rich or poor, young or old, black or white, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. American, Japanese, healthy and handicapped. We're much more sensitive to our handicapped today, aren't we? The handicapped were cursed by God, that's why they're suffering the way they are, right? That was the old attitude. We know better than that now. He came for the whole wide world. And that's red and yellow, black and white, isn't it? We sing a song to that. Everyone is precious in his sight. That means there is hope for you on uh, this Christmas time. If you are lonely this year, Simeon meant to include you. If your family has rejected you, Simeon meant to include you. If you feel forgotten, depressed, discouraged, down on your luck, be of good cheer. Christmas is for you. That's what Simeon tells us.